Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Frederick March and Martha Scott in One Foot in Heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Visible from far off as you approach even the smallest of American villages is a majestic symbol of the freedom we've always loved and now are fighting for. Pointing straight to the sky, the church steeple dominates the landscape. And in its shadow for more than three centuries, America has been a citadel of religious liberty, a haven for the oppressed and persecuted of many lands. Guardian of this liberty are the pastors of thousands of American churches who work quietly, unselfishly, courageously, and with good humor, as will be abundantly evident in tonight's play, One Foot in Heaven. The Warner Brothers picture is based on the best-selling book by Hartwell Spence. And this evening we have the same stars who gave such delightful performances on the screen. Frederick March, and Martha Scott. It's a drama of the author's own family, and no father and mother ever had a finer tribute than this one written by their son. A story of real people that goes right to the soul of America. Crossing the New Mexico desert the other day, I saw three brave little buildings pioneering a town, a church, a general store, and a motion picture theater. And on the marquee of the theater, believe it or not, blazed the familiar name, Lux. Now, I wouldn't have been surprised to find that sign in the window of the general store, because wherever two roads cross, from Tom Times Square to Tompkins Corners, you're rather certain to find Lux Flakes for sale. But the idea of a desert namesake of the Lux Radio Theater hadn't occurred to me. Our good wishes go to our brother impresario of the wide open spaces, and any number of ladies in his audience will tell him he picked a magic name for his enterprise. They've seen Lux Flakes work magic a hundred times. And here's the curtain now for One Foot in Heaven, starring Frederick March as Will Spence and Martha Scott as Hope. Wednesday night choir practice. I guess I've heard that same hymn every Wednesday night for the best part of my life. <laughs> a minister's wife hears a lot of singing in her time. In some towns, the choirs have been good. In some towns, they've been mighty bad, but it's always been nice to listen to. My husband is the Reverend William Spence. Will got the call way back in 1904. Let's see, it's 1926 now, that's 22 years ago. We weren't married then, just engaged. Will was studying to be a doctor. And then one evening, he came to our house to speak to my mother and father. I remember the way Will stood there in the parlor, talking very quietly. But you could tell he meant what he said. Here's the way it is, Father Morris. The other night, uh, I happened to be walking past a church in Toronto. I had nothing to do, and I went inside. There was a revival meeting going on, and there was a man who was preaching, Bishop Hartzell of the Methodist Society. It was a wonderful sermon, and as I listened, something happened to me. I guess you'd have to say I got the call. Maybe you'll laugh at that, but it was just as clear as if the Lord was there and had placed his hand on my shoulder. And anyway, I've decided to become a minister. Will and I were married just before we left for Iowa. There was a vacancy there, a small town church in Laketon. And nobody met us at the station. We had to ride to the parsonage in a meat wagon. I don't know what I expected to find at that parsonage, but I was mighty disappointed. The house was a shambles. There were old rag rugs on the floor, horrible pictures, and 
of all things, a boar's head on the wall. The wallpaper was faded and peeling. The windows were unwashed. I began to clean and dust and take down some of those pictures. The boar's head I hid away in a closet. And then the ladies of the parsonage committee arrived. They took the house by storm. You must sit and rest, dear. We'll do everything, Mrs. Spain. Martha, just look at this dust. I hate to bring this up, but can anyone tell me who removed my boar's head? <laughs> I'm up here. Up where? Up here. Well, what on earth are you doing in the attic? Why, well, I, I was just in the way. Oh, oh, have you been crying? Well, just a little. Oh, they wouldn't let me touch a thing. I had to put back everything, every ugliness in its proper place. And I won't be able to use my wedding presents or anything because they think I'm stuck up. Lesson number one, dear. The parsonage belongs to the ladies of the congregation. Ah, oh, but they're good folks, dear. Look at all the gifts they brought. A table full of pies and cakes. They're kindly and friendly, and sometimes as thoughtless as children. Of such is the kingdom of heaven. Yes, I know. I am ashamed, but... Well, I used to plan what our first home would be like, but this is... No, don't let me say it. Don't let me complain. I'll say it for you. This house? Why, it is. It looks like a place the county poor farm has abandoned. A, a dog wouldn't live in it. A, a cat wouldn't be caught dead under the front porch. The, the moths starve to death here, and the, and the mice smother in the dust. Oh, Will. You're wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. I'm all right now. Of course you are. We're both going to be all right. Why, consider my princely salary. $385 a year. If I can collect it. <laughs> oh, Will. <laughs> our first parsonage. But the ones that followed were just like it. As we moved from town to town, our problems became even greater, for our family was growing. First came Eileen, and then the boy, Hartzell, and then in 1917 in Fort Dodge, our third was born, another boy. <laughs> Fort Dodge. <laughs> I'll always remember that parsonage. It stood right next to the firehouse. Oh! What's the matter, Will? Oh, can you tell me why in thunderation this parsonage should have been built next to a firehouse? Darling, I can't even tell you why this parsonage should have been built at all. The bell goes off at the most provoking times. It, it disturbs me when I'm preparing my sermons. It interrupts my prayers. It even wakes the baby in his sleep. Bells, bells, bells. And uh, speaking of the baby, dear, don't you think it's high time he was christened? I wasn't aware that we were speaking of the baby, Hope. You know my wishes in that matter. I've said my last word on the subject. Well, I haven't. Neither of a lot of other people. A Methodist baby should be christened before it's ten days old, and here our poor child's almost three months old and not named yet. The minister's child will. If you persist with this topic of conversation, dear, I shall only change it. A hundred times if necessary. All right, dear. To what? To anything. What is there for supper, for instance? Not a thing. What did you say? I said not a thing. You mean that literally? Literally, figuratively, and specifically. Statistically, there's one half loaf of bread and a quarter of a pound of butter. What are we going to do? Haven't you any money at all? Well, I have this ten-cent piece. Oh. I've been hoarding it for three weeks. It's our entire cash capital. And your quarterly salary not due until next week. Well, can't I telephone the grocer to send something out on credit? Mother, you see this book? What is it? I could tell you without looking. The Methodist Discipline. Hmm? And what is the discipline? The discipline of the Methodist Church is the printed collection of its rules and regulations, declarations of faith, and order of services. It sets forth certain admonitions concerning personal conduct. Thus, it prohibits the hoarding of money, the accumulation of wealth, or the going into debt. That's it. That's it, the going into debt. It forbids labor on the Sabbath, even the preparation of meals. It outlaws motion pictures, dancing, tobacco. We may not play any card game which might be used for gambling. Mother, you, you sure know your discipline. Oh, I ought to. We've lived it for 13 years. Now it appears we are also to eat it. Give me the book, Father, and I'll stew it in the pot. Though I imagine it'll prove tough fare. <laughs> you know, dear, a minister's life is like walking a tightrope. With one foot on earth and one foot already in heaven. 
Ah, if only a wedding couple would come along. Golly, what a $5 wedding fee would do for us now. Mm. Or even a $2 wedding fee. <laughs> oh, well, something will turn up. The Lord has always provided for us. Uh, goodbye, Mother. I've got some calls to make. Goodbye, dear. Eileen, bring the baby into the house. Bring in your poor, unnamed brother. Tom Shaw. Uh, Hotel. Yes, sir? Hotel, I'm, uh, I'm going out for a little while, so you keep the watch. I'm going to the courthouse first, then I'm going to the drugstore to talk to Mr. McFarlane. You stay right here and keep a sharp eye open. If any wedding couples come along, you'll know where to find me. Yes, Father. Aren't you going in the car? There uh, isn't any gas. Hello, Mac. Hello, Brother Spence. How are you? Need some throat lozenges? No, not today, Mac. Uh, take them anyway. Missed the plate last Sunday. Oh, thanks. Well, what's new, Mac? Well, let me see. Oh, Mrs. Johnson ordered another prescription of sleeping tablets today. Mm -hmm. Third this month. That's so. Well, I'll make a note of that. She must have some problem on her mind. Yeah. And I hear Henry's been seen across the railroad tracks. Of course, that's only talk. Oh, sure, sure. Nothing much else. The Billingses are fighting. He's off on a toot again. Uh, but you must have heard that. Mm. Well, I don't know what to do without you, Mac. What I don't know is how you do all you do. Everybody and his neighbor's personal troubles 24 hours a day. All part of the job, Mac. Father, yeah. there's a wedding couple who want to get married. Don't bother me, son. I'm talking to... Otto, did you say a wedding couple? Yes, Father. A wedding? Mother's got them in the living room. They've been waiting an awful long time. All right, all right. I'm coming. Uh, so long, Mac. Thank you. So long. Uh, Come on, Father. They're waiting. No, no, no unseemly haste now, Hotzel, but uh, let's go. Father, wait for me. Goodbye. 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 <laughs> don't, don't forget to bring the firstborn back, back to the church to be baptized. <laughs> Thank you, Goodbye. Reverend. Goodbye. <laughs> uh, very nice couple, Hope. Very nice. Well, I suppose I shouldn't ask, but did you get the wedding fee? I'm holding on to it for dear life. How much was it? Five dollars or two? I haven't dared look. Well, I noticed you used your five dollar line of jokes. What do you mean? Now, don't pretend you don't know what I'm talking about. Well, you start off the minute they come in. You use a different set of jokes for each price range. And the minute you open your mouth, I can tell which you've decided it is. Ah, oh, how you do go on. Your two-dollar opening goes like this. Be careful how you answer these questions, young lady. It's perjury to falsify your age on the marriage record. But your five-dollar opening is, Come in, come in, so you want to get married. Well, you're wise to get a ring on this young lady's finger before someone else does. Oh, what a lot of fun. But it's after the ceremony that you really do yourself proud. The two-dollar form. All right, kiss her now. That's what you've been waiting for. But your five-dollar wind-up's a humdinger. All right, you're married. And if you don't hurry up and kiss the bride, young man, I'll do it myself. <laughs> <laughs> Molly, you've gotten to know me too well. <laughs> Why, well, I, I always give them the same ceremony. Yes, for nothing or a million dollars, you'd give them the best that's in you. I love weddings. Perhaps because I had such good luck at my own. Well, shall we look at the fee? Yes, all right, all right. We've allowed ourselves sufficient time to demonstrate that we're people of iron self-control. Here. Well, two dollars. That's the first time I've ever been wrong. <laughs> I must be slipping. Oh, well, two dollars is two dollars. <clears throat> Run inside and call up the grocer, Mother. Tell him to send something out for supper. Well, I've always done whatever you say, haven't I? Now, what's up? Just this. I'm not going to feel very well preparing your dinner tonight or any other night until we get the question of the baby's name settled. Now, dear, this is not the time to discuss baby's name. I'm hungry. It's the most perfect time in the world. I'll never again get you in such weakened condition. I am perfectly willing at any time to christen baby, but I will not have him named Plain William Spence. He's got to have a middle name. He wouldn't be Plain William Spence. He'd be William Spence, Junior. Junior. Very well, Mother. I'll knuckle down to you to the extent of William. Providing we call the child by his middle name, which middle name is to be Fraser? After five o'clock, dear. Did you say you were hungry? We can argue here till doomsday, and I'll still like William Spence, Jr. Very well, Mother. I'll give in. I'll name the baby. This Sunday? This Sunday. Now our 
privilege to administer the sacrament of baptism to such children of the congregation as shall be presented by their parents. The name, please. John Henry Appleby. John Henry Appleby. I baptize thee in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Next, please. The name? William Spence, Jr. William Fraser Spence. <gasps> I baptize thee in the name of the Father, the Son. I wonder what's keeping your father. It's an hour since church was out. Here he comes, Mother. He's just coming up the walk, Mother. Oh, so he is. I want to see him. Father named the baby wrong. I'll bet you'll give him Hail Columbia. Shh. Don't swear. It's Sunday. <laughs> I'll bet she does, too. Hello, Will. Oh, hello, hello, Mother. I, uh, I'm late. I stopped to talk to a lot of people. Nothing will spoil. And I, I uh, stopped to get this to bring you. Here. Oh, ice cream. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how is the baby? Baby? Yes, it's baby. Fraser's having his afternoon nap. Fraser? Fraser. Thank you, Mother. Thank you for the ice cream, Will. Hmm, strawberry. Your favorite kind. <laughs> we had lived in Fort Dodge for about two years until one Sunday morning in 1917, I wasn't at the church. The baby had a cold and I stayed home. Will was preaching his sermon. He was just in the middle of it when the alarm sounded. It was quite a blaze. The parsonage was burning down. Hold up. Hold up. Where are you? I'm here. Here, Will. Is, is everything all right? The first time I ever missed church in the house burned Hold down. Did, did you save my book? Did you get my books out all right? Yes, Will, I did, but oh, my... Oh, bless you for that, Mother. Bless you. And what about the children? Well, they're safe, too, but my... Well, where are they? Well, over that way, Will. Well, I've been trying to tell you that my new hat's in the house. Look at that house burn. As heartily as any sinner in hell. Oh. See, see, Benson, the firehouse is on fire. What? The firehouse, sir, it's burning. And you can't do anything for the parsonage, but for Pete's sake, don't let the firehouse burn down. No, my new hat, Will. The one I paid five dollars for. What the blaze? Of course, if you don't care. Oh, now, Mother, don't you cry. <laughs> what if the old parsonage does burn up? They need it, and you wouldn't, and we're moving anyway. We're moving. Yeah, right away, yes. The telegram came this morning, but I didn't have time to tell you. Well, where are we going? Well, And uh, what about the parsonage? Oh, I do hope it's a nice one for a change. The children are entitled to a respectable home, even if they are the minister's family. Tell you the truth, I didn't inquire about the parsonage, but don't get your hopes up. <laughs> We're going to Sioux City. There's a detachment of troops stationed there, and as well as being pastor, I'm going to be their chaplain. You see, there are a lot of young men piling into the army these days, Mother, and... They're going to need spiritual guidance. You're, you're going to join the army? Well, in a way. Oh, well. Now I guess I'll have to bring up my children in a pup tent. <laughs> Mr. DeMille presents Act Two of One Foot in Heaven, starring Frederick March and Martha Scott, in just a moment. During our intermission... We have a very charming guest to introduce to you. Here's a hint about her. Yes, she's from Dixie, the land of cotton. Miss Camille McLean Anderson, the maid of cotton for 1942. Back home in Memphis, Tennessee, she's a debutante. But right now, she's making an exciting 15,000-mile tour of leading department stores to star in a fashion show of the newest luxable cotton. Welcome to the Lux Radio Theater, Miss Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Roy. I'm delighted to have a chance to tell you about our fashion show and how really smart the new cottons are. Well, are they all as attractive as the dress you're wearing, Miss Anderson? Yes, and this is one of my pets, an evening dress in a Mexican rose print seersucker. It's one of the dresses chosen for me in New York by Harper's Bazaar. And like the other things in the style show, it's made of cotton, and it luxes beautifully. Everything in your style show is luxable, Miss Anderson? Mm-hmm. There are evening dresses, slacks, and sport clothes. And daytime dresses like one honey of a blue and white striped suit. And then I have some defense clothes with me, suggested by the Department of Agriculture. They show that work clothes can be not only practical, but well-styled and good-looking, too. 
So cottons are smart, lovely to look at, and practical, too. Oh, my, yes. They look like lambs. We've locked everything in our show time after time. They look fresh as the day we left New York. Lux Care is thrifty, too. It costs less than a penny to Lux a dress. And gentle Lux keeps fabrics and colors bright and new-looking longer. What's the next stop on your tour? Well, we'll be in New York and San Francisco this week. Then we'll go to Salt Lake City, Spokane, Seattle, Portland, and Denver before starting back east. Local newspapers will announce the time and place of the fashion shows. Thank you, Miss Anderson, for being with us tonight. Best of luck to you on your tour. Well, I've enjoyed being here, Mr. Root, and I'd like to wish you and everyone listening in not only lots of luck, but lots of luck flakes, too. Thank you. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Curtain rises on the second act of One Foot in Heaven, starring Frederick March as Will Spence and Martha Scott as Hope. Through the war and afterwards, there was a long procession of parsonages, each just as dreary as the one before. In 1923, when things began to pick up a little, we were in Denver, Colorado. Prices were soaring, land prices, incomes, everything was going sky high. But the roof of our parsonage leaked in 18 places. Hope! Hope, you hear me? I'm coming, I'm coming. What is it? You know how many holes there are on this roof? 18. I've just counted them. Yes, dear, I do know. Three in the hallway, four in the boys' bedroom. Two in Eileen's room, one in ours. Well, it's an outrage. Yes, dear, I told you last month before the spring rains began. Doesn't matter what you told me last month. I know that, dear. You're an independent thinker, and you like to discover things for yourself. Now you found out that we have 18 leaks. That makes it official. Think the parsonage committee would do something about it. Have you told Mrs. Sandow? No, I haven't. But I'd like to let myself go and really tell her what I think. You rich old hen, you, sitting up there in your stone chicken coop on top of that hill... Just because you built the church, you think you can run the whole shebang. No, dear, it doesn't do any good to hold imaginary conversations with Mrs. Sandow. Why don't you telephone her? Telephone? Bosh, I'm going to see her. Let's see if her house is dry and woe betide her if it is. Hey, Hutzel, Hutzel, put another pan under this leak. Oh. In the kitchen, Will. Well, I didn't see Mrs. Sandow. What's the matter? Is, is that a new leak? Yes, just started. That makes 19. It's indecent. Trying to keep it from falling in the food. But if the stew tonight's a little weaker than usual, you'll know the reason why. Will, why are you standing there staring at me? Because I'm seeing you for the first time. Ah, oh, what an absurd thing to say. You've seen me every day for 20 years. That's just what I mean. I haven't been able to see the forest for the trees. I'm seeing you as you are, Hope. The wife of a parson. And I'm remembering the trials you've had to put up with. Your dream of having a nice home. Your work in the church. Full-time job in itself. Still, you've found time to manage a house, cook and mend and scrub for a family, comfort a husband. And you've borne all this with the serenity of a Madonna. Nobody can turn a phrase as well as you can. Mother, we're going to have a new parsonage. Yes. What did Mrs. Sandow say? Well, she wasn't home. No? Oh, I uh, had a visit with her gardener, Samson. Fine fellow. But I saw the inside of Mrs. Sandow's house dry. Even her garage was dry. Well, what's necessary for a car ought to be necessary for a preacher. What are you going to do? I don't know. Well, it's going to be difficult. The parsonage is so handy to the church, you'll never get them to build a new one. Not as long as this one stands, certainly. Hmm. That's an idea. What is? Now, Will, you're not going to burn this one down. No, but I'm going to get a new church built right on this spot. Then they'll have to build a new parsonage. Oh, Will. Besides, we need a new church. Everybody's building something. New homes, new stores, new banks. And while they're about it, they can build something for God. Hartzel, answer the door. Yes, ma'am. Mother, you're going to have the home you've always dreamed about, and I'm going to have my church. And Mrs. Sandow is going to pay for most of it. Is Mr. Spence at home? Yes, ma'am, he is. 
Well, it's Mrs. Sandow. Why, uh, come in, Mrs. Sandow. Thank you. Brother Spence, I'd like to speak to you. Well, 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 Mrs. Sandow, you couldn't have come at a more opportune time. Brother Spence, I hear you've been calling on my gardener, Samson. Yes, indeed. Fine and devout man. I'll have none of it. Excuse me. I didn't uh, hear you correctly. Oh, yes, you did. I said I'll have none of it. You mean that I cannot call on Samson? You may not. You realize what you've done. You put Samson on my social plane. You're my pastor and you'll call on me. My gardener belongs in the garden. Your gardener is also a member of my church. Not at all. He attends the evening service. Well, Sister Lydia... Don't you I... sister me. Tell me, uh, don't you have Samson in for evening prayers? I do. I also have prayers with my maids. But I don't invite my servants to tea. But we are all children of God. There is no distinction in his sight. If Samson wants to go to church to save his soul, that's one thing. It's different entirely for my pastor to call on him and have tea with him. I'm sorry, Sister Lydia, but I cannot agree with you. Then you are no longer my pastor. From this day on, I'm a Baptist. <laughs> well, there goes your church and my parsonage. Not on your life. This church is not a one-man proposition, nor a one-woman one either. We can put up a church without her. Mrs. Sandow was baptized a Methodist, she married a Methodist, and she'll die a Methodist. She'll be back. Will seemed to get into trouble from that day on. Oh, it wasn't with the whole congregation or anything like that, just a few of the members. But they happened to be the influential members, the richer ones like Mr. Preston Thurston. The whole thing began when the building committee went over the plans for the new church. Brother Spence, will you kindly explain to me why in these proposed plans you have changed the location of the choir loft? Oh, is the uh, choir moved, Preston? You know very well it is. My wife won't like it, my cousin Luella Digby won't like it, and I don't like it. Well, I've always thought that the function of a choir was to be uh, heard rather than seen. Are you implying that my wife's face is not fit to look oh, at? not at all, not at all, Preston. Will it help to shorten the conversation if I remind you that my donations to this church have been considerable? I had planned on a donation to the new church at around $50,000. Well, that's a lot of money. A lot of money. Of course, I've uh, put you down for $75,000. But even so, it's a lot of money. Have you thought what it would mean if I withdrew my support from this project? Sure, we know what it would mean. Oh, Dr. Roma, I wouldn't. Uh... None of your cronies would contribute either, and all those people you've got under your thumb, they'd be afraid to contribute oh, too. Now, no, that, that's enough, Doctor. Let him talk. I think in his crude way, he makes the position rather clear. That was just the start. The real trouble wasn't long in coming. It seems Will decided to let the old choir have a rest for a few weeks and let the children's hymn group take its place. But the old choir didn't want a rest. When church was over that first Sunday, Mr. and Mrs. Thurston and Luella Digby were waiting for Will on the steps. I presume you're proud of yourself, Brother Spence? Hell, now, Preston, I, I didn't think that my sermon today was anything to brag about. We're not referring to your sermon. He's talking about those children. The whole thing was a put-up job, wasn't it? Yes, Preston, I guess we'd have to say it was a put-up job. For years, I've let you run the choir as you wanted, and many's the Sunday I've gone home with a headache. We demand that you reinstate the choir at once. I won't mince words, Brother Spence. Those children are not going to sing again as long as I'm head of the music committee. Now, now, you don't mean that. You're just excited. I do mean it. And I'll mean it tomorrow or the next day or any day you can name. Then, Mrs. Thurston, I can only accept your resignation with thanks for your many years of service. What do you mean, accept her resignation? I think you're forgetting that church appointments are made and unmade by me. That is a condition which no longer exists in this church. In that case, this church is no longer big enough for you and me. Oh, I think it is, Preston. Just remember what I say. One of us will go. And I have an idea which one it will be. Oh, hello, Hot. Oh, Hot, sir, what are you doing home from school? It's only two o'clock. I know. May I speak to your father? Yes, of course. You're not playing hooky. No, sir. Something's happened. You better tell me, son. I... I've been expelled, Father. Expelled? Yes, sir. Mr. Haskins called me into the principal's office and said I was dismissed. Well, why? What for? Well... Well... 
Do you know Elsie Mayfield's father? I believe I know some Mayfields. A uh, congregationalist family, aren't they? Her father's an electrician, but I don't know if he's a congregationalist or not. Did you try to convert her? Is that it? No, sir. Elsie was in my Latin class, but, but she isn't anymore. Well, why isn't Elsie Mayfield in your Latin class anymore? Her family's moved to San Francisco, and Mr. Haskins said it was on my account the family moved away. He said they had to get Elsie out of town. Do I have to say anything more, Father? Son, if ever in your life you lied to me, don't do it now. Are you or are you not guilty? No, sir. I'm not. All right. I believe you. I think I'll have a talk with Mr. Haskins. <laughs> Mr. Haskins, are you willing to take the responsibility for expelling the boy on the strength of a rumor? Uh, naturally, I, I conducted a thorough investigation before I acted. I'd appreciate it if you'd tell me where it led you. Well, uh, our superintendent of schools got the story from Mr. Moody. Mr. Moody heard it from Mr. Simmons, who was told by Sister Goldwaite. Uh, she had gone to tea one afternoon at Luella Digby's uh, did, and... Uh, did you say Luella Digby? Yes. The story was told there under the promise never to divulge the source. Luella Digby. One more step and we arrive at Mrs. Preston Thurston. Well, I hope those people are happy. They've done a very good job of ruining a young boy's life. Will was very discouraged. He said when a pastor is no longer wanted, he can be of no service to his congregation. Then came the offer of a new post in California. We went out there, Will and I, to look things over and decide. The church was lovely. The loveliest church I had ever seen. It's beautiful, isn't it, Mother? A sermon that you can read through your eyes. A symbol of God's beauty. Everything you've hoped for, Will. And the parsonage. You liked it, didn't you? I could tell. The look in your eyes. Like a kitten set before a dish of cream. Everything I've hoped for. Rich congregation, magnificent salary. And all I have to do is say yes. That's all, Will. It's a very little word. Maybe too little. What does that mean? I can't do it, Mother. I can't accept the fruit of another man's labor and be like stealing. And I can't quit in the middle of a fight and become known as a man who couldn't finish a job. I'm going home. You mind? I'm glad, Will. Thank you. Now, where was it the uh, Mayfield family moved to? The Mayfield family? San Francisco, wasn't it? Would you like to go home by way of San Francisco? Hmm? We could see the Golden Gate. Good afternoon, Mr. Stewart. Good afternoon. Is Mrs. Thurston at home? Why, yes, sir. She and Mrs. Digby are in the parlor. Mrs. Digby. Good. Who is that, Hilda? It's Mr. Spence, ma'am. Oh. How do you do? Good afternoon, Mrs. Thurston. Good afternoon, Mrs. Digby. Brother Spence, I heard you were away in California. Yeah, I'm back. I suppose you're coming on your hands and knees now to invite us back into the choir. Not on your life. I came to haul you into court and your whole tribe with you. Mercy me. Oh, you'll do what? Mrs. Thurston, thank God I'm a Christian or I'd kill you. Oh. Where? Oh. Where the sin? What on earth has come over you? You know as well as I do. You thought you'd planted your little deception carefully. You thought it would be a fine way to get me out of town, didn't you? But you overlooked one thing, Mrs. Thurston. A preacher stops being a preacher and starts being a father when his son is attacked. I, I don't know what you're talking don't about. Don't add another falsehood to your sins. I know the whole story. Luella Digby... I'm going to tell from my pulpit what you and your crowd have done and shame you publicly. No. The Mayfields moved to San Francisco only because the father got a better job. And believe me, I know. I went to San Francisco and found out. Oh. You crucified a guiltless boy, didn't you? Didn't you? Yes, Brother Spence. You don't deserve to live. The only reason you don't die is because the good Lord wouldn't know what to do with you. Good day, ladies. What are you going to do? I'm going to make you suffer the way you... No. No, I'm not either. 
with a great deal of assistance from the Thurston family, I'm going to build a new church. Oh, come in, Preston. Uh, I hurried over as fast as I could. My wife just telephoned yeah, me. Yeah, I can imagine, Preston. I, I'll do anything you want. Never again oppose you. Oh, now, Preston, don't say that. The Lord needs a voice to say no in his church as often as he needs one to say yes. And believe me, Preston, your uh, generous contribution of $85,000 is going to be a big help. $85,000? Mm -hmm. oh, oh, come to think of it, that's just the amount I had in mind. <laughs> Now, wait a minute, boys. Wait a minute. Adding a whole building is going to throw our budget sky high again. We'll just have to cut out something. Now, what about this item? One stained glass tree of Jesse window. No, no, John. I want that window. It's a lot of money. And this, one Skinner organ, $10,000. We have to have an organ. Here's a, a big item. A car... A car... Carillon. Uh, car That's a high-class name for what amounts to just a set of bells. $25,000 for a set of bells? But gentlemen, we can't cut out any of these items. I've ordered them. The Carillon is uh, on its way from Switzerland. You mean to say you went ahead and ordered things even before we had a meeting? Oh, I, I knew I could bring you boys around once I set my mind to it. And it looks like a clear-cut issue between the parsonage and these luxuries. You, you, Judas. I'm sorry to interrupt this pleasant meeting, gentlemen, but Mrs. Sandow's here, Will. Oh, send her away. I've tried to, but she won't go away. She says she'll sit on our front steps and sing hymns until you consent to see her. All right, all right, I'll see her. Excuse me, gentlemen. I said, the whole thing thing I say Why did she have to come tonight? Why did she have to come when I need her? I don't know, dear, but there she is. I know what I'll do. I'll refuse her. I'll be strong. Brother Spence. Dear Brother Spence. Go home. I'm a sinful old woman. Well, have you been neglecting your prayers, Mrs. Sandow? Oh, but I know. I mean, because of going over to the Baptist. I don't see any sin in that. I think Brother Carmichael's flock will get to heaven as fast as we will. And uh, he's, a, he's a good preacher. But not like you, Brother Spence. People don't join a preacher, Mrs. Sandow. They join a church. Have you no sympathy? Don't you want me back? No. I'll be good. You're not good. <laughs> You're a wicked old woman. Oh. You come here now when I'm weak and you, you prey upon my sympathy. Oh, I... You sit there sniveling as if you were sincere. I am sincere. Yeah. Brother Spence, my husband practically built the old church. I, I feel so out of things. Your husband was a sinful man, Sister Lydia. Oh. But when his pride burned out of him, he found his real richness in charity. In our new church, we should have a mighty caroline from Switzerland. Chimes to peel out across the town as his goodness rang out. Now, now, see what you're making me say. Good night, Mr. Sandow. Oh, please, please let me give the chimes, Brother Spence. If only as a memorial to Thaddeus. And I renew my church subscription. I'll, I'll double it. That would be very generous. We are desperately in need of funds to build a new church. And uh, if... Uh, you would care to give a tree of Jesse window in your husband's memory? Brother Spence, I will. And Thaddeus will give the chimes. Very well, sister. On behalf of the church, I accept his bequest of a tree of Jesse window and a $25,000 set of chimes and a $10,000 Skinner organ. That's the best choir practice we've had yet. Yes, the new church helps, Will. Yes. You know, Mother, I was reading an article the other day which said that Christianity was dying. <laughs> Humbug. Just beginning to live. People are more Christian in their homes and in their hearts. Don't let anybody fool you about Christianity, Mother. If God thought his church were in any danger, he'd come to its rescue. Hope, uh, I had a letter from the bishop the other day. I know what it is. We're going to move, aren't we? Yes, dear. Oh, well, just when we have everything we've wanted. A home for our family, a beautiful church for you. He said there's a little church back in Iowa that's in trouble. I won't do it. I always did like Iowa. 
I like the country people. I won't let you do it. I'll write to the bishop myself and tell him. That the church was in trouble, Mother. All the more reason your health won't stand. Another fight will kill you. Well, what better way of dying than in harness? How long have you been thinking about this? Two or three weeks. Then you've decided? Yes, Mother. There's no sense in arguing. We'll go. I'll go with you, Will. I'll be glad to go. Entreat me not to leave me or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. I know, dear. I know. Bless you, Mother. <laughs> Our stars will return to their curtain call. But now, let's take a look at your garden early next fall. Most of the flowers are through blooming. But look, look at those gorgeous chrysanthemums. That stunning bronze color, the pure white, that wonderful shell pink. Why, some of the blossoms are three or four inches across. Yes, you can have chrysanthemums like that in your garden next fall. The Lux Flakes Garden Club is offering you three hardy early flowering chrysanthemum plants. A whole dollar's worth for just 10 cents and the opening tab from a large box of Lux Flakes. They're all first quality, well-rooted, field-grown plants. The feature mum, included in each set of three, is a clear, glowing shell pink. And every one of our plants has been given a special vitamin treatment with transplantone for stronger roots and earlier flowering. They'll thrive year after year in your garden or in flower pots or sunny window boxes. Order as many sets as you like. But don't delay, for our supply is limited. Here's what you do. Write your name and address on a piece of paper or on the handy order blank which your dealer has. Mail it with 10 cents in coin and the opening tab from a large box of Lux Flakes to Lux Garden Club, Hollywood, California. Now please allow at least two weeks for your chrysanthemum plants to reach you. With them, we'll send a leaflet of planting instructions and another telling you how to get other flower bargains. Remember... For each set of three plants you order, send 10 cents in coin. No stamps, please. 10 cents in coin and the opening tab from a large box of Lux Flakes to Lux Garden Club, Hollywood, California. Do it tonight. And be sure to include your own name and address, of course. This offer is good only in the United States. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. To our gallery of memorable performances in the Lux Radio Theater... We'll add those given tonight by Frederick March and Martha Scott. Thank you, C.B. It was a real pleasure to join Martha in retelling this inspiring story. You know, Mr. DeMille, one foot in heaven is an experience I'll always remember. It's the first time I've ever played the part of a living person. And the responsibility rather frightened me. I don't think you need to worry about what Mrs. Spence thought of your performance tonight, Martha. I understand she was very pleased with the picture. Yes, she was. I loved meeting and knowing her because... She's exactly the same lovable person that she is in the story. If she's listening in tonight, I'd like to wish her all the happiness in the world. It was a privilege to help keep alive the memory of her husband. And now, Mr. DeMille, perhaps you'd better explain to the audience why the Lux Radio Theater is 15 minutes shorter than usual tonight. The government has a message for every man, woman, and child in America, Martha. So we're giving up the last quarter hour of our Lux Radio Theater time tonight to this message. Well, next week you'll have an hour as usual, won't you, C.B.? Yes, Freddie, but it's an unusual hour because our play will be Penny Serenade and our stars will be Robert Taylor and Barbara Stanwyck. Penny Serenade is adapted from the Columbia Picture Hit, a story of a young married couple and the child that brought them happiness. It's a drama of courage and inspiration and the two stars like Barbara Stanwyck and Robert Taylor... We have an inspiring cast for next Monday night. I think your audience will agree with that, C.B. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, Martha and Freddie. You were good missionaries tonight. And don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned to this station for a message from our government. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, Join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Robert Taylor and Barbara Stanwyck in Penny Serenade with Beulah Bondi and Edgar Buchanan. 
This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Frederick Marsh appears tonight with the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and will soon be seen in their production of I Married a Witch. Heard in tonight's play were Verna Felton as Mrs. Sandow, Leo Cleary as Thurston, Josephine Whittell as Mrs. Thurston, and Eugene Forsyth, Griff Barnett, Noreen Gamill, Bruce Payne, Doris Cedarholm, Dick Davis, Leon Ledoux, William Melton, and Priscilla Lyons. Tune in next Monday night to hear Barbara Stanwyck and Robert Taylor in Penny Serenade. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer...